Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to spend some time today talking about the E2 visa options, where the investment amount is low, and other types of risky E2 cases. Um, just a few things before we get started. Um, as some of you may know, our firm, Scott Legal PC, was founded on an E2 visa several years ago. Our founder, Ian Scott, is in the US personally on an E2 visa. Our firm is a full service immigration firm, but we focus primarily on E2 visas. We have processed hundreds of them and we typically process E2 visas that are high risk, um, which usually means lower investment um, than the amount that you would normally see. We will continue our webinar series doing at least two webinars a month on different immigration topics. At the end of this webinar, we're going to send out a few things. Um, first off, the PowerPoint presentation that you're seeing right now, a comprehensive E2 visa guide, and a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars. For panelists today, we are very lucky to have Kelly Wiener, who is a partner at the firm and has vast experience processing E2 visas. My name is Hugh Plessis. I'm a senior associate at the firm, and I will be the moderator. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat box. I will monitor the questions and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, finally, this webinar will be recorded and made available on demand. Without further delay, I will turn it over to Kelly to start the presentation. Thank you. Perfect. So um, we will get started today um, just talking a little bit about the basic E2 visa requirements. Um, you know, so one, you know, main requirement is that you have to be a national of a treaty country. Um, so this means a country that has a treaty with the United States um, that usually offers reciprocal benefits to U.S. citizens um, to have visas in those countries. Um, so there are many, many treaty countries. Um, you know, including, you know, Canada, you know, the UK, France, you know, many and, you know, kind of all over the world in Europe and South America and Africa. Um, so that's your starting point is, you know, do you have a passport uh, from a treaty country? Uh, so the second requirement, if you want to be an E2 investor, um, is that you must own at least 50% of the E2 company um, and have majority, you know, the ability to control and develop and direct the company. Um, another requirement is that you have to make an investment. So this is an investor visa. So you have to um, invest funds and put them at risk in the commercial sense. The funds have to be both at risk and irrevocably committed. That's kind of the language and the regulations. Um, and this means that you are not permitted to kind of take you know, a bunch of cash and just put it in a business bank account and say, well, I will have business expenses and I'll spend it on that. Um, they do require that the money actually be put at risk um, in the commercial sense before they will issue the visa. Um, you know, this is due to concerns that if you just had cash in the business bank account and now you have a work visa, um, you know, they're, they're not convinced that you're really going to, um, you know, do what you say you're going to do. So by putting that money at risk, you're showing, yes, um, I have a real vested interest here in continuing, um, you know, this particular type of business. I spent money on this. This is what I intend to do. Um, for this investment, you also need to show the source of the money um, to prove that it came from a legitimate source and not from any, you know, kind of illicit or criminal activities. Um, Different sources, you know, can work. For example, um, it can be personal savings from employment. You can also receive the funds through a gift. Um, you know, you could sell some property. Um, loans will work as well. Uh, although the loans cannot be kind of business loans secured by the assets of the E2 company. Um, as well, if you're getting a loan or you're having a gift, you still need to show the source of that money. So for example, if your parents are giving you a gift, um, you would need a letter from them, um, you know, a gift letter that explains where they got the money. And then you would need to back that up with evidence. So if it was from, you know, if they sold a home or something like that, you would provide, you know, the proof that they had sold that home and received that money and then transferred that money to you in the form of a gift. Um, another requirement is that the um, the investment has to be substantial, and we'll talk a bit more about this later in the presentation, um, but there is no dollar figure of what is considered to be substantial. Um, so what is substantial is the amount that is necessary to get the business up and running. So for smaller investment amounts, like the ones we're going to talk about today, um, you really need to have invested kind of the full amount to get the business to the point of being operational versus for very, very large investments, you know, 
know, let's say somebody's starting up a huge manufacturing plant that, you know, requires investments of millions of dollars, maybe if they invest a lower percentage of that, um, you know, maybe they invest, you know, 50% of the money to get that to the point of being operational, um, but it's still millions of dollars, the magnitude of that investment can be enough sometimes. Um, so, but today we're really going to focus on those types of cases where it's lower investment amounts. And that's where you really ne do need to be able to argue you spent everything necessary to get the business, um, you know, to the point of being operational. Um, so another, um, you know, uh, when we look at kind of what are typical E2 expenditures, we've list, listed some of them here, and we'll also talk more about this later in the presentation. Um, but you want to think about what type of business am I starting and what do I need for that business to become operational? So many businesses are going to need things like inventory, equipment, a website, office supplies, um, you know, some type of, of business premises, whether it's a warehouse or a commercial office space. Marketing is also important or any fees you pay to actually set up your business entity, any professional fees. So we'll go over some of that later as well. Um, there is something to note when you are starting up a brand new business versus purchasing a business, um, there is uh, some difference there. Uh, so there is sometimes more of an ability to protect your investment when you are purchasing a business um, because you can use something called an escrow arrangement. Um, so this is where You'll sign a purchase sale agreement, um, you know, to buy a business, all conditions, um, you know, have been satisfied. Um, but instead of transferring the money to the seller, the money will be transferred to an escrow agent and the escrow agent will hold that money um, with the instruction uh, only to release the money to the seller if the E2 visa is approved. And if the E2 visa is denied, the instruction is to return that money, um, you know, to the E2 investor, to the buyer. Uh, so there is an ability to kind of protect yourself a little bit more in your investment when you are purchasing a business. Um, so another E2 requirement is that the business cannot be marginal. Um, so this means the business has to support more than just the investor and their family. And what this really translates into is that you need to hire employees in the United States uh, for your business. So the E2 is really not for um, somebody who wants to come in and operate as a solo consultant, for example. They really want to see uh, that the investment um, is going and the business is going to you know, make a substantial economic impact and um, you know, support employment in the United States. Uh, so another E2 requirement is that the business has to be real and operating. Um, so this can mean kind of one or two of two things. You know, if you're buying an existing business that's already running, then you're going to show, okay, this business is taking in revenue. Here's the tax returns. You know, here's the W-2s. You know, here's invoices, contracts, you know, proof that this is an ongoing legitimate business, licenses, things like that. Um, if you're starting up a brand new business, um, you still have to meet this requirement to show the business is real and operating. Um, but you're going to show slightly different documentation. So you're going to show things like, you know, assigned commercial lease, that you've set up your business entity, that you've created your website, that you have maybe, you know, um, prospective contracts or letters of intent or memorandums of understanding, um, that you've acquired any licenses that are needed. And there is language, um, you know, in the Foreign Affairs Manual that supports the idea that for these pre-operational businesses, this is the type of evidence that is, um, you know, can be used uh, to show that um, the business will meet this real and operating requirement. Um, so another E2 requirement is you have to show that you um, will be developing and directing the E2 business. Um, so, you know, often this is, you know, they're going to look at, do you have the proper ownership, you know, the majority ownership, the ability to develop and direct the business. Um, and then they're also going to consider the investor's background. Uh, so, you know, what is your work history? Um, have you worked in a similar field? Or maybe if not in a similar field, have you run other types of companies? Um, it's not required that you have experience in the particular type of business you're starting, but it is certainly helpful. Um, and some type of work experience is helpful as well. Um, we, we certainly have done E2 visas for people who are, um, you know, maybe just graduating, um, you know, or newer to their field. Uh, but those can be more challenging cases. And you do need to do a bit more, um, you know, to show that the person is going to be able to, um, you know, develop and direct the company successfully. Um, so finally, um, another requirement for the E2 is that you have to have the intent to return to your home country upon the expiration of the E2 visa. Um, so this is a uh, relatively low standard for proving non-immigrant intent for the E2. Um, there's language in the Foreign Affairs Manual that says that, you know, you can you don't have to maintain a residence abroad. You can move your entire residence to the United States, and the E2 can also be renewed indefinitely. However, you do need to be willing to declare that, you know, you intend to return to your home country once the E2 visa, you know, you know, runs out or expires. Um, 
And if you have any other kind of factors in your case, like you have a lot of family that are U.S. citizens, um, or you've ever had a um, an employment based or family based, you know, immigrant petition filed on your behalf, <clears throat> that's something they will take into account. So in those types of cases, you may want to prepare kind of more proof of ties to your home country. All right. So moving on, um, we'll dig a little bit more into um, a couple, uh, you know, a couple more things about E2 visa requirements. Uh, so as I discussed briefly on the pre previous slide, there's kind of two options for the E2 visa. So one is you are purchasing an existing business. Um, you know, you know, another is kind of starting a business and this can include starting, you know, a, you know, brand new type of business. It can also include starting a franchise. Um, you know, as, as mentioned, sometimes um, there can be advantages to purchasing an existing business. You know, one major one being that instead of spending money in various, you know, areas trying to get the business to the point of being operational, you can spend one lump sum to purchase an existing business, put that into an escrow account, um, and you will get, you know, minus maybe some fees, you know, you will get the bulk of that money back if the E2 visa is denied. Sometimes it can be a bit difficult, um, you know, just because, the person you're working with or the company you're working with the seller you know may you know you know may have some reservations about these types of of arrangements that being said you know we certainly do process these types of cases but it is also very viable to start up a brand new business it's just knowing that you know it may be more difficult to you know recover the bulk of the investment um because you can't use the escrow arrangement in the same way um, so as as previously mentioned as well, uh, you know, these these visas are based on treaties. Um, sometimes, you know, new treaties are signed, you know, so in the past few years, you know, Israel became an E2 treaty country, um, Portugal became an E2 treaty country. So there are new countries that are added to the list. Um, and there are countries that are removed as well. So you do always want to look um, to make sure that there is an active treaty um, if you're applying for this type of visa. Um, a common question we get is how long will the visa be granted for? Um, so if you are getting a visa at a consulate abroad, the length of the visa is going to depend on um, something called the reciprocity schedule. So these are kind of reciprocal agreements between the United States and the other country as to how long these types of visas can be granted. Um, the reciprocity schedule also changes. Um, so sometimes, you know, um, periodically the, the government will revise, you know, how long the visa can be issued for, um, often in response to, you know, how long visas are issued for to U.S. citizens by this other country. Um, um, so, you know, there's some visas that are only issued for three months, for example, you know, nationals of Bangladesh um, or Egypt, you know, your E2 visa is issued for three months only. However, when you enter the U.S., you can be granted two years on E2 status. Um, there's other countries, for example, um, the United Kingdom, uh, you know, and also uh, Canada. Um, the visa can be granted for five years. Uh, you know, that being said, even if you have a five-year visa, each time you enter, you can be granted two years in E2 status. Um, it is much easier for people with five-year visas, though, because, you know, after the two years, they can always just leave and re-enter using that same valid visa, versus if you have a visa that's only valid for three months and you need to travel a lot, you will be needing to go back to the consulate, submitting a new E2 application, um, or extending your status from within the United States. All right, so very common question, um, how much investment is enough? Uh, so, you know, the uh, the language and the regulations is you have to invest a substantial amount. Um, and there is no dollar figure. So very often the E2 is confused with the EB5. Um, and for the EB5, this is a green card option, um, you know, an investment green card option. And there are fixed amounts that you must invest. Um, but this is different for the E2. There's a lot more flexibility. Um, it really depends on the type of the business you're starting up. Um, and they look at what's called the proportionality test. So how much have you invested versus what are the usual costs to establish that type of business? Um, so, you know, sometimes it can be very helpful to include in your application, maybe some market research reports, um, you know, or, um, you know, sometimes articles from business magazines will talk about what are the normal startup costs for various types of businesses. Um, so sometimes it can be really advantageous. You can get an article that says, hey, if you want to be a business consultant, you know, you can start up a business with, you know, somewhere between $2,000 and $10,000. So submitting an article like that, when you've invested closer to $50,000, you know, that can also kind of try to support your argument that you really have spent everything necessary to start up this type of business. Um, other things you can include are, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, if your investment is on the lower side, maybe you have a CPA assess your business plan and your investment schedule um, and write some type of opinion, uh, you know, explaining their thoughts on whether or not, um, you know, this is sufficient, uh, you know, to, just to launch this type of business. 
Um, so there is, when you're starting up a new business, you know, again, there is a lot of flexibility in being able to define, here's what we need. Um, you know, certainly uh, if it's a business that requires a lot of tangible items, if you're opening up a manufacturing plant, something like that, um, you know, and you don't have a commercial space, you know, those are going to be major issues. Um, however, for many kind of service-based businesses, uh, you know, often you can invest a, you know, a much lower amount, um, you know, cannot be, I think, you know, as low as 2000 or 10,000 even, uh, but, you know, significantly lower than, um, you know, anything where there's going to be a lot of fixed costs. Um, when we talk about buying a business and the proportionality test, um, generally the fair market value of the business, um, you know, is considered a substantial amount. Um, you know, and that's going to be the purchase price in situations where there's no relationship between, you know, the, the buyer and the seller. If you're in a situation where, um, you know, you have a family relationship, uh, that may be something where you want to get a valuation done. Um, and certainly the amount that you're paying for the business should make sense in light of the business financials. So if you have a business that shows, you know, huge profits and huge amounts of assets, um, you know, but the purchase price is very low, you know, they could, they could look at that and say, you know, what's going on here. Um, so, you know, if it's a, you know, an arm's length transaction where you really don't know, um, the seller, you know, very often you can just, you know, pay the purchase price and that's going to be sufficient. All right. So let's talk about some strategies, um, you know, to deal with a low dollar amount in an E2 visa application. Um, so one important one is to really make sure that all the other parts of the application are as strong as possible. Um, you know, so you really want to stress all of the other positive factors. You know, if you um, are going to have a lower investment amount, perhaps you, uh, you know, actually hire an employee before you file. That can be really advantageous. Um, you know, you really, you know, maybe you have a significant experience bringing businesses like this, you know, through, you know, to success and maybe you've sold similar businesses or worked in similar areas. Um, you really want to be, um, you know, strategic about controlling everything you can um, and making it as strong as possible. So it's a very, especially for service-based businesses, it's very advantageous to have contracts, to have letters of intent, um, to show that there's a demand, um, you know, for the services you're offering. Uh, you can also join a local chamber chamber of commerce. And if you do so, um, you know, very often, maybe if you meet with them, um, you know, they're often willing to write uh, letters indicating, you know, that they're excited about welcoming your business into their community. Community. So showing that you have kind of local business partners or have formed business partnerships um, also can be very advantageous um, to show the viability of the business. Um, you know, sometimes people like, let's say, for example, someone's, you know, here on an F1 on OPT and they've started up a business. Uh, maybe they've, you know, they've already started to get clients um, and maybe have some, you know, minimal revenue. That can sometimes be helpful as well. Again, just to show, you know, once I get this visa, I, the company really will start operating right away. Um, a strong business plan is really key, um, you know, especially for startups, uh, you know, it provides an opportunity to really frame the business, uh, explain in a common sense way, here's how we're going to market ourselves, here's what we sell, here's how we're going to make money, um, you know, so, so that's something that's very important for these types of applications. Um, hiring employees is always great, particularly, uh, you know, if you um, maybe you've run a, you know, you're a solo consultant or you've run a business without hiring people, um, you know, some hiring employees can really kind of address this, um, you know, concern the officer may have. And then as well, as we mentioned on the other slide, you know, getting a CPA letter, having, um, you know, an objective professional assess the business's viability, assess the investment schedule. Um, those things I think can can carry some weight with um, the consular officer to feel like, okay, this person really has, you know, looked at this strategically and, and spent everything necessary to get this business to the point of being operational. All right. So some common E2 visa expenditures. Um, and again, you know, when you're thinking about E2 visa expenditures for a startup, you do need to think, you know, what type of business am I starting and what do I need for that business to be operational? So for example, if you're starting a restaurant, you know, some of the things here, you know, may look different. Um, but for many kind of more service-based businesses, you know, software consulting, business consulting, marketing consulting, you know, anything like that, um, you know, a lot of these expenditures, you know, will be relevant for many different types of businesses while also keeping in mind, what do I need for my specific business? Um, so for ex some examples here, you know, website, you know, computers, printers, scanners, um, inventory, you know, trademark, um, furniture can be included only if it's used for business purposes. So, you know, 
many times people will come to us and say, well, I'm going to have a home office and, you know, work at my dining room table. These are not good expenditures. They make your case look weaker. Um, and if an officer flags it, you know, they, you know, it, it can kind of cause them to do a closer look at each one of your investments. Um, and you really don't want to have that happen. Um, you know, other things, you know, listed here, you know, uh, sponsorship or trade show appearances, fees for licenses. Um, training courses can sometimes be included, but you do want to be strategic about this. Um, for example, you know, you know, let's say, you know, uh, like you're doing an E2 for a law firm, you're not going to include the cost of your law school tuition. Uh, you know, those types of things can be, you know, but let's say that you're doing a marketing consultancy and you took a, you know, a marketing consulting course that, you know, was really fundamental to you, you know, being able to, to work on your business. Maybe you can include that. They're not the strongest, but some, sometimes they can be included. Similarly, you know, with a car, a vehicle, um, very commonly people want to, to include this cost. Um, if it is, absolutely necessary for the type of business, like you're doing a food delivery truck, uh, you know, or a taxi service, um, you know, or a construction company, you know, where you need to haul lumber, like those types of things, um, usually where the vehicle is going to be insured, um, you know, with commercial insurance, where the vehicle may even, even be wrapped with advertising, those types of vehicles, yes, those can be included. If you're saying, well, I need to buy a car because I'm going to need to get around. And then also I will, you know, drive it to and from my office. That's generally not going to be a strong E2 expense. Um, so, you know, let's talk about some kind of good versus bad expenditures. So here's some kind of weak expenditures. Um, these are ones where, uh, you know, it's really not good to include them because any benefit you get from the higher investment amount, it's, it's really not going to, you know, work out that way in the long run because the officer will look at these expenses and say, these look weak, um, you know, and, and they think you're just padding the application. So, you know, flights, uh, you know, travel accommodations, meals, you know, taxis, um, entertainment, um, expenses that are directly reimbursed by your, you know, your clients, um, any expenses paid to related parties. So let's say you own a company abroad and you own a company in the U.S. If you, you know, your, your U.S. company pays the company abroad for a website, um, but you own both companies, that's really not going to look like you've put your money at risk in a commercial sense. Um, and in fact, some consulates even have on their website, you know, do not include <laughs> flights, do not include travel expenses. So they're being very clear that they do not view these as kind of relevant valid expenditures for the E2. Um, better not to include them at all than to try to include them to get your investment amount higher. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about some specific challenges for some different types of high risk, um, you know, E2 uh, applications. So, you know, one are consulting businesses. So we do many, many consulting businesses, um, you know, so certainly they can be very viable and successful, you know, E2 applications. That being said, um, they are on the riskier side, uh, you know, because of the officers sometimes will be concerned well, this person's coming in to operate as a solo consultant. Um, you know, they're, they think that perhaps you're not going to actually develop a larger business um, that's going to be more than marginal and support U.S. workers in the United States. Um, another challenge with consulting businesses is that theoretically, a very low investment is needed. Um, so very common kind of thing that we hear from our clients is, well, I don't really, I don't think I can have this visa because what could I spend money on? I have my computer, I have my knowledge, I have my contacts, I don't need anything else. Um, so when you're when you're approaching these types of cases, um, you want to be thinking about, um, okay, you know, what can I spend money on, uh, you know, that I would perhaps have waited later into year one or year two to spend money on, but I'm going to bring those expenses up and spend them now because it's better for the application. So you always want to spend money on things that are really necessary and relevant for your business, um, but you really can't apply for the E2 visa just saying, well, I've spent $500 on a printer and I don't need anything else. Um, it is an investor visa and you do have to show that you have committed, you know, and invested enough money um, that the officer feels that you have, you know, are, are committed to investing um, and, and developing this enterprise. Um, so, you know, things that you can consider one is office space. Sometimes you can prepay, uh, you know, for a certain amount. Um, unfortunately, you cannot just rely on a signed contract. Uh, so you can't say, well, I've, I've signed this contract and I'm on the hook to pay this money, you know, for the next 12 months. You do have to actually have spent it before you submit in order for it to be included as part of the investment. Um, another is equipment. Um, you know, so let's say you plan to hire, have three employees, you know, by the end of, of the second year, maybe you purchase those computers and that office equipment for those employees now, uh, instead of waiting. 
Um, similarly, marketing, uh, you know, maybe you, you thought, well, I can get by with a really bare bones website because I'm really relying on my contacts initially, but perhaps you, you know, get an upgraded website or maybe you, um, you know, contract with a PR firm or you do a little bit more on the marketing side, um, things you may have waited for, you know, and, until later, but you push them up because this is really helpful for the business and it's helpful for the, the visa application. Um, you do want to spend over a larger number of categories. So um, we find that officers are not, you know, they, they don't like it if you say, well, I've spent, you know, I, I, I paid for office space and then I paid $40,000 to a marketing firm. That's really not going to be a strong, even though the amount may be good, it's not really a strong, um, you know, proof of investment because what they, again, what they want to see is I've spent everything necessary to get this business to the point of being operational. So that's where you want to say, you know, I've, I've spent on marketing, I've spent on, you know, equipment, I've spent on employees, I spent on professional fees, I've spent on licenses. So they really want to, you know, think holistically, what do I actually need to get this business up and running and have you spent in those areas? Um, so another area where there can be a lot of challenges um, for E2s are real estate uh, companies. So the concern here um, is that many people um, you know, are under the impression that perhaps you can just purchase uh, a residence, um, you know, in the name of an LLC, and that can be the E2 investment. And um, that does not work. And again, many consulates um, are aware of this, they and have in their FAQs, particularly on the E2, you cannot do, you know, you cannot just purchase a home. Um, the reason is, you know, it's not a real and operating business. Um, you know, even if you're maybe renting it out and collecting some rental income, that's generally considered passive. Um, so your challenge here is that you need to show this is a real and operating business. This is not just a, you know, an idle investment um, that I'm holding here. Um, you have to show that you're going to hire employees so that the business will, you know, be more than marginal. Um, that being said, you know, even though it's a riskier, um, you know, area, we certainly have done these successfully. Um, you know, we have some ideas, you know, that, that have, are listed here that have worked in the past. So, you know, one, a real estate brokerage firm, you know, a property management company, renovation or construction, house flipping if you're doing it on a large scale. Um, again, with property management as well. You couldn't purchase one home and say, well, I'm managing that property. That being said, let's say you have a home you've purchased and then your company is also going to manage other properties and seek out other clients. That could work, certainly. Or let's say you're going to have you know, a, a renovation company that focuses on home renovation, but you're also going to have a smaller service line where you do house flipping. That's fine. You can certainly incorporate those things in. Um, where you get into trouble is if you say, well, I purchased one home and I'm going to flip it. That I think on its own often is not going to be considered active enough to, for an E2. Um, if you're doing it on a large scale, this could work. So we've had clients where they had a portfolio of 30 or 40 homes um, and they were doing that, you know, that house flipping on a very large scale. They had many, many employees and subcontractors. Um, and so those types of things, as long as you can show, you know, there's really a service um, or good being provided, there's a lot of revenue, there's the ability to hire employees. Um, you know, that certainly can work for real estate. You also want to keep in mind licensing, especially if you're doing something like, you know, you're a realtor or a broker. Um, each state has their own licensing requirements. Um, so sometimes you will need, you know, similar with construction. So sometimes you'll need to kind of partner uh, with maybe um, licensed individuals on the ground until you can kind of get your social security number and get licensed yourself. Um, so there can be some creative workarounds you need to think about, but you do want to just be aware of the landscape, um, the licensing requirements in the, the, the state where you're setting up. <clears throat> so um, another kind of risky area um, E2 visas for equity trading companies, and they share a lot of, um, you know, kind of commonalities with the the issues you see with real estate uh, E2s. So similarly, you know, just placing your stock portfolio in the name of an LLC, this is not going to qualify. Um, it's not active enough, you know, to qualify for the E2 visa. Um, you know, also, if you say, well, I'm going to be trading for a couple of my friends and some of my family, again, you go back to the, you know, is it is it real and operating? Are you going to hire employees? Um, it's also a highly regulated industry, so you need to show that you have the proper licenses. Very often, there's going to be kind of multiple structures, um, you know, if you're doing a hedge fund or something like that. So you do want to, you know, just make sure that, um, you know, you're working with um, with your attorneys and your immigration attorneys to make sure that everything is set up in such a way that it will work for the E2 to really show that this is going to be an active business uh, that's going to, you know, have the ability to hire employees. 
All right. Um, so let's talk about some reasons for E2 denials. Uh, so, you know, one is low investment amount, you know, so we've talked about a few different ways uh, you can kind of protect, you know, against this, you know, that being said, um, you know, there are uh, some investment amounts that are just too low. Uh, you know, we, we've had a, a client come to us one time where they had filed on their own and they spent $2,000 and had $98,000 in a business bank account. Um, and the officer actually said, you know, spend more money, invest more and come back. Uh, so we, you know, advise them on how to kind of, you know, increase the investment amount in a way that made sense for the business. Um, and then they were able to, uh, you know, to successfully get the, get the visa, but as well, you know, there are some, uh, then, you know, venues that just aren't, are not as receptive, uh, to low investment amounts. So, one of the um, you know reasons listed here is filing location and venue. So you do want to uh, you know think about this. You want to keep in mind where are my options? Uh, can I um, you know can I perhaps uh, apply somewhere else other than my home country if my home country is one where higher investment amounts are preferred? Um, so something definitely an important conversation to have with your attorney, especially as, um, you know, trends change. Uh, so consular officers do shift over time and, um, you know, trends at various consulates about what is or isn't substantial will change um, as well. You know, consulates that see a lot of very large businesses, lots of multinational companies sending dozens and dozens of E2 employees. They may be less receptive to, you know, the smaller entrepreneur, um, whereas other consulates may be more receptive. Um, so that's an important conversation, you know, to have with your attorney as you're determining where um, where to apply. Um, nature of the business can be a reason for E2 denial. So again, um, you know, we've talked today about, you know, different areas like real estate, equity trading, consultancies. Um, you know, these are slightly riskier cases inherently, and so you do want to go in thinking, how can I, you know, um, you know, mitigate some of these risk factors. Um, another reason may be, let's say you ran a similar business in your home country for years and you never hired employees. Um, you know, that can be a concern for an officer. You know, they may not be as willing to rely on a business plan um, when they have a demonstrated history that you've never hired anyone. So in those types of cases, it may be better to hire somebody before you apply um, to help, you know, uh, you know, ease that concern. Um, and so these two here for reasons denials, concern over whether the business will create jobs for U.S. workers. These are, you know, the same, um, the same concern. Concern. Um, really here you're addressing, you know, will the business be marginal? And this is where the business plan can be really important and hiring employees before you file can be very important. Um, it is not a requirement that you hire employees before you file. That being said, you know, going back to different consular uh, officers have different ideas. Um, there are can be trends at various consulates where they really, you know, insist that they won't grant it unless there are already employees. So Again, always always important to be aware of where you're where you're filing. Um, another thing that can happen is issues with the adjudicating officer. You know, consular officers are human beings. Um, you know, they have kind of different uh, different temperaments. Um, you know, and, and different ideas about what works and what doesn't. Um, so, if you do have uh, you know a denial and you feel that the officer was not um, you know, not hearing you, or you feel like it was really you know not not a not a fair interview, you can always try to reapply. Um, and most consulates will try to give you a different officer. It's not guaranteed. It's more of a courtesy, um, you know, but but it can be something that can be helpful um, to keep in mind that um, just because you had one difficult officer doesn't mean it's impossible for your case to be approved if you have an otherwise strong case. Um, another reason, maybe you didn't meet the requirements at the time of filing, um, you know, like, let's say you want to be an E2 investor and you went in and you own 25% of the company, um, you know, that may not work, um, you know, so, uh, you know, that's where it is important to kind of understand what the requirements are to make sure that you are meeting them, uh, you know, at the time that you that you apply. All right, um, let's talk about some E2 visa adjudication trends. Um, you know, so there are, um, you know, very uh, generally E2 visas ha have a very high approval rate. Um, so, you know, government, you know, the government will kind of generally post um, statistics, uh, you know, like e each year, um, you know, government posted approval rates are between 80 to 90 percent. Um, you know, our approval rate is around 98 percent, although we, we know that past results do not predict future outcome. We can never guarantee that a visa will be approved. That being said, we have processed many of these. So we do understand, you know, what can be done to try to strengthen an application um, in terms of timelines, uh, you know, so. Con this is uh, hard to nail down um, for many consulates. Some of them do post publicly what their uh, you know timelines are. So, for example, London has publicly posted that their timeline for review is about sixty working days. 
Um, that being said, that's not a guarantee. Um, you know, there are times where they're within that time frame, and there are times where perhaps they're taking a bit longer. Uh, you know, right now I'd say they're, you know, perhaps a bit on the, you know, longer side than the 60 working days. Um, you know, but not too much longer. Um, so after that time frame, they call you, they call the applicant and, you know, or contact them through email and say, yes, you can schedule your interview. Uh, and then most interviews can be scheduled within, you know, uh, within about a month. Um, this can, again, this can change during the summer, during the winter, uh, you know, particularly the holiday season. Sometimes it can take quite a while to get an appointment. Um, so always important to kind of discuss with your attorney what's happening at that point in time. Um, right now for Toronto, um, they're, you know, relatively fast consulate. They'll review within about 10 to 15 business days and then allow you to schedule an appointment. And usually appointments are available within a few weeks. Similarly, um, you know, usually within a month or so, um, you know, give or take a you know, week or two. Um, you know, generally in terms of timelines, it really can be all over the place. There are some consulates that, you know, have recovered from COVID fully, like Toronto and London are really two of those. And there are some where there's still huge delays. Um, you know, Bogota comes to mind, uh, you know, where they really uh, only started accepting E2 visa applications again very recently, and delays can be over a year. Uh, so, you know, that, that part really is uh, very different, um, you know, for each consulate. Uh, another option um, when you, we've been talking a lot about consular processing, get a, getting a visa at a consulate. So I do want to talk about USCIS filings versus filing for a visa at a consulate. If you file a petition with USCIS uh, for an E2, this has to be done while you're in the US in a valid status. Um, you can't be on ESTA, for example, but let's say you entered on a B, um, a B visa. Um, you can file to change your status um, to, you know, to E2 with USCIS. If this is approved, um, you do not get a, uh, a visa stamp that allows you to travel. What you get is an approval notice from USCIS that allows you to stay in the U.S. for up to two years and to run your business. Um, so if you're somebody who needs to travel frequently, uh, you know, USCIS may not be, uh, you know, a, a very good option. Um, you know, other issues with USCIS, they take a very, very strict approach to the source and trail of funds. Um, so if you have a very complex source and trail of funds, the money came from multiple places, it was transferred through multiple bank accounts, they will um, ask to see all of that. Um, that being said, there are some benefits to USCIS, you know, one being, you know, um, timing is, you know, you can pay for premium processing uh, and get an answer within, you know, 15 business days. Uh, so, you know, it could be an approval, a denial or a request for more evidence. If it's a request for more evidence, you'll submit that evidence and then they'll issue usually a final decision, uh, you know, within 15 business days of getting the response. Um, so that, you know, that can be very favorable favorable for some people, especially if they're in a situation where the only consulates they can apply at are one of these very backlog consulates and they can't wait. Uh, you know, sometimes USCIS can be helpful for that. As well, um, USCIS is much more receptive to lower investment amounts. Um, you know, sometimes uh, we've had cases approved even as low as $19,000. Um, you know, they're not the easiest cases to get approved. Uh, that being said, that it, it can be possible um, depending on what type of business you have. Uh, and whether you can make a realistic argument that spending only that amount, um, you know, is necessary was all that was necessary to get your business to the point of being operational. Um, so when we contrast, you know, USCIS and the consulate, um, if you go to a consulate, you're going to get a visa stamp in your passport, um, as discussed earlier in the presentation. For some countries, that may be three months. Much more commonly, though, it's a period of years, even up to five years. Um, and so for many people, if the option is either a two-year approval with USCIS where they cannot travel or a five-year visa stamp that permits them to travel internationally freely, uh, you know, they may be, you know, more interested in that kind of five-year visa stamp um, as well, depending on which consulate you go to. Consulates do tend to take a much more kind of holistic, high-level view of the source of funds. Um, you know, so if you say, well, I'm, I've, uh, you know, my source of my money is, you know, from employment, you can maybe provide a couple years of your tax returns, proof of you transferring the money to the to the business. Whereas for USCIS, they would say, okay, great, provide the tax returns and the bank statements, um, and then show your pay stubs, you know, and your payroll entering your bank account. If you transferred it somewhere else, show where that went to. And they would really want to see that you have maintained enough money from the source, from your payroll, uh, you know, to uh, to show that the source actually was, you know, um, you know, employment savings. So, it, you know, really kind of a lot of strategy considerations here, something that's important to discuss, you know, with your attorney, um, you know, before you decide which way to go. 
Um, so there, there are some kind of post specific considerations. So each consulate is really its own, um, even though the law is the same, each consulate is really its own universe. It has its own rules. It has its own way that it wants things done. Um, you know, so consular instructions, you know, generally, um, you know, especially for posts that process a lot of E2 visas, they provide, uh, you know, these instructions um, and you do need to follow them. And very often they will say, if you do not provide this in the way that we ask you, we will send it back to you. We will not accept it. Um, you know, uh, many consulates will now accept, um, you know, email submissions uh, and they have ways they want things done. They do want zip files or they don't want zip files or it has to be a certain size. So all of that does have to be taken into consideration when preparing the application. Um, also consular preferences. Um, so I think we talked, you know, in the other slide about, you know, venue is important. Um, there are trends in how consular officers view E2 visas and what counts as a substantial investment or what works, um, whether you need employees or not. Uh, so you do want to, um, you know, take that into account. It's generally helpful to apply for the E2 visa with an attorney who is familiar with that particular consulate um, or has access to colleagues who process at those consulates so they can advise on, you know, what's kind of happening happening on the ground at that point in time. Um, another thing that some consulates have started to do is, um, you know, when you, if you submit a business plan, sometimes they ask for a certification by a CPA. Um, you know, this is something wh somewhere where Scout Legal can also be of great assistance because uh, we do both prepare business plans and we also have a CPA on staff um, who's able to cert certify them as well. All right, so um, some issues, um, some kind of complex areas that come up for E2 visas. Uh, you know, one, um, you know, do you have to hire employees before you apply? So uh, I kind of touched on this earlier, and the answer is no, there is no requirement that you hire the employees before you apply. However, it is helpful. It certainly does strengthen the application. And as discussed, there may be some consulates, you know, often ones who are just not as familiar with, um, you know, kind of individual entrepreneurs and smaller businesses uh, who may really, you know, insist on this um, or, you know, really want it um, before you apply. So it can be helpful. Um, other things that can kind of make the the case more complex is if you have a very complicated source and trail of funds. For USCIS filings, this gets extra complicated because again, they will want to see each, um, you know, uh, like exactly where the money went to. You know, if you were in a situation where you say, "Well, I got this lump sum of money and I took it out and I put the cash under my bed," um, you know. And, and then I just left it there for a few years and then I put it back in a bank, you know, you may be in trouble there. It may be difficult. Um, you know, USCIS can be very, very strict about this type of thing. Um, you know, uh, other things that can come up with source and trail of funds, you know, one is loans. So, um, you know, we see sometimes uh, someone's purchasing a business, maybe they want to do seller, you know, seller financing. Um, this is really not a good idea for the E2 most of the time, um, because this is based on, you know, is the security or the assets of the E2 business. And that's kind of the one prohibition on loans. They can be personal loans, um, you know, they can be secured by your personal property. Like, let's say you have a, you know, home equity loan, um, or you have, you know, a line of credit um, that's in your personal name where you are the one making the guarantee, that that's fine, that can work. Um, but you you want to stay away from things like seller financing or, you know, issues where the, um, you know, any loan that is secured by the assets of the E2 business, even if you yourself are also offering a personal guarantee, it's still not a, um, a strong thing for the application. Um, gifts as well, you know, so again, gifts are fine. Um, however, it doesn't remove the requirement that you show the funds came from a legitimate source. So you do still need to keep in mind, if I'm getting a gift from, from someone, um, are they going to be willing to share with me the sensitive financial information that I need to show that this is a legitimate um, you know, source of funds? Um, as well, you want to think about what is the relationship and how can it be explained? Um, you know, if it's really not clear, uh, there are, you know, or it's a huge gift um, and it's, you know, a very distant relative, you know, sometimes they will have questions about that. Uh, so you do want to kind of keep that in mind, um, you know, generally just, just what is the narrative, you know, what, um, you know, what is the situation here? Um, because the officers are trained to look for situations that, you know, don't seem normal, that don't seem, uh, you know, like common sense or practical explanations. Um so people will also ask, uh, can I do two E2 visas? Um, you know, I have a business partner. We want to own the business together. Can we do that? Um, and the answer is yes. If you own the business 50-50, um, you know, 
the, that that is fine. Um, if it's a situation where um, you want to own it in, in different percentages, um, then you know, and you are the same nationality, then you can potentially do an E two investor and an E two employee application. Um, maybe you own it sixty forty, and the sixty percent owner is the E two investor, and the forty percent owner is an E two employee. Please note that only works if you have the same nationality. Let's say if somebody is you know, the 60% owner is Canadian and the 40% owner is Spanish, that is not going to work, um, you know, for the E2. It does have to be 50-50 in that case. Um, as well, when you're thinking about two E2 investors, um, the investments ideally should be, you know, they don't have to be exactly the same, but you want them to generally match. You know, if one person's investing $5,000 and one person's investing $100,000, you know, it's going to be quite difficult for the person only investing $5,000 to say they've made a substantial investment. Um, something else to consider are um, kind of substantive changes to the E2 business after filing. So it, it is, there are times when people will kind of get a, um, get they get a five-year visa maybe, and they think, okay, great, I have my work visa, I can just kind of proceed um, with like that. Uh, however, in order for the visa to remain valid, um, you, the business needs to continue to meet the E2 requirements. So if there's a change in ownership where the company is no longer at least 50% owned by treaty country nationals, that's going to be very problematic. That means the visa is really no longer valid um, as of the time that you know it's sold or the ownership changes. Similarly, um, substantial changes to the type of the business. Let's say you had a restaurant and it, it didn't go well. And now under the same LLC, you want to just close the restaurant and start a wedding photography business. Um, you know, they're too different. Uh, you, you cannot just do that without going back to the government first and getting a new approval. Um, and there's two ways to do that. One is either you go back to the consulate um, or you can also file um, an application or a petition with USCIS that says I'm making a substantive change to my business. Um, you know, here's the evidence of that. Please, you know, approve this. Um, you may need to include proof of, you know, additional investment to support the new type of business. Um, it's also important to keep in mind, though, that um, you may not need to go back with every business change. Um, you know, that's why, why in your business plan, maybe you want to contemplate a few different things. So let's say you're going to be doing software consulting, but you also want to be doing some mobile app development, but really maybe not until years three or four. You can contemplate that in your business plan and explain to the officer, you know, the start, you know, the main initial service is software consulting. However, we'll also be doing mobile app development. So at that point, if the business starts to veer in that direction, you've already disclosed it. Um, and it's not something where you would necessarily need to go back. Um, similarly, anything that's kind of a natural outgrowth of your business, um, it's not going to be considered a substantive change. You wouldn't need to necessarily go back. So for example, you know, you have a wedding photography business and now you're going to start up, you know, a blog where you're selling, you know, those photos that can probably be, you know, similar enough that you're not really needing to go back, um, you know, although there is the option to submit um, the petition to USCIS, even for them to just weigh in and tell you, yes, it's substantial or not. The important thing is that anytime you're contemplating a major change like this, you want to talk to your attorney, um, you know, before you make the change, uh, because if you've made the change and, you know, then you're in a situation where maybe you're possibly out of status and then it's harder to, you know, to fix. Um, another complex area, you know, family business purchases. So we talked about this a little bit more, you know, or a little bit prior, but, um, you know, if you're purchasing a business from a family member, they're automatically going to, you know, wonder a bit more, is this really, uh, you know, the, a substantial investment? Is this the fair, you know, market value of this business? Um, that's where it can be helpful to get a CPA letter or some type of official valuation for the business. At the very least, the purchase price should absolutely make sense in light of the financials. And if you don't have a third party who has kind of objective third party who's weighed in, again, at the very least, you want to have an explanation for the officer. Here's how we calculated this. We looked at the assets. We looked at the liabilities. We looked at the profits and the revenue. Um, you want to have an explanation. Here's how we arrived at this number. Um, and that's why, it, you know, it, it should uh, qualify as a substantial investment. All right. So we've reached the end of the presentation. I think we're going to see if any questions yeah. came came in. Right. Yeah. We, we have two questions here. Um, so the first one is, um, if I use my profits from my Amazon store as an investment for my E2 business, which is going to be a different company, 
can I keep operating my Amazon store after obtaining the E2 visa, or do I have to close all my other businesses and focus on the E2 uh, business in the US? Yeah, so basically the E2 visa is company specific. Um, so you're getting the visa for the company that you're submitting the application for. Um, you can kind of have multiple service lines under one business. Um, so that's not to say that you only have to run the trunk, trucking company. If you have potentially other businesses, there may be ways to create a structure um, where you can continue to work for other businesses. But if you're going to do that, um, when you submit the application, you have to show you've invested a substantial amount to start up all of those types of businesses. So, um, you know, definitely, uh, like if you only submit an application for the trucking company to the consulate, then when you're physically in the US, you're not authorized to run these other businesses. Um, however, sometimes you may, may incorporate into your business plan that, um, you know, doing management for other types of companies may be one of your service lines. And then you have management services agreements with other LLCs or other corporations. So there can be some creative ways to deal with it. Um, but it is a uh, something you'd want to kind of plan out in advance with an attorney to avoid violating your status. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, another question here about um, a software company and how would that work for an E2? So the question is, I have a software business in my home country. Can I transfer that software slash IP to a US entity and use that for the E2? Um, they're currently getting the software valued by a valuator and uh, looks like it's going to be over uh, or about 80K for um, that uh, software. So can I use this to get an E2? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so IP, um, you know, can be used uh, as part of your E2 investment. Um, you know, if you're getting it, you know, by uh, valued by a licensed valuator, that's great. Um, you would also want to invest in other areas, though, similar to what we talked about. Um, the idea is to show you spent everything necessary to get the business to the point of being operational. So the IP may be kind of the main part of the investment, but you would also need to invest, um, you know, additional, you know, additional amounts, uh, you know, other than that. Great, thanks. Um, another question here is about dependents. Um, so how do children qualify under the E2 visa? And if they're qualified, are they able to work in the US? Uh, yes, great question. So um, children, you can bring your spouse and any unmarried children under 21 as your dependents to the United States. Uh, the spouse is able to work, but unfortunately, no, children cannot work um, based on being E2 dependents. Um, they are permitted to go to school, but are not permitted to work. Um, another question here is about employees and can those employees be commission based or do they need to be W2 employees? Yeah, so um, either can work, um, but it's it's much more beneficial to have W-2 employees as opposed to independent contractors. Um, if, if you're in an industry where, you know, like the construction industry, for example, maybe, you know, we've had clients where they maybe they don't have employee W-2 employees, but they've paid millions of dollars to subcontractors. In that case, you're still able to argue, I think the business is not marginal, um, but definitely it's it's for most businesses, it's going to be much more advantageous to have at least a few W-2 employees. Um, thank you. Um, another question here is about um, someone who has already raw materials or equipment in Canada, for example, can that be included in an E2? Yes. Um, so you can, uh, as long as you have, um, you know, proof of how you purchase the source of how you purchased uh, those raw materials and that equipment. So you would still need to show um, that this is your personal investment, um, you know, and, 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 you know, what, what money you use to purchase them. Um, a few more questions to go through. So th this next one is, it's a good point to start applying for an E2 visa if uh, that person's goal is to start a beverage company. Um, they are saying that they have about 50K to 100K for the investment. Yeah, I'm not sure I, um, I'm not sure I understand this question, uh, you know, in terms of uh, at Timing, what point to start yeah. applying? Yeah, so, so it may be, um, you know, something where it's good to set up a consultation to talk through the timelines. Uh, you know, as we mentioned during the presentation, the money does have to be spent, you know, the, the LLC has to be set up or the corporation has to be set up. The money has to be transferred and actually spent um, before you apply. So, um, you know, happy to kind of talk about the timeline and more specifics, uh, you know, on a consult. I um, have another question here is about um, IT consultant, consultancy. So uh, the question is, uh, if uh, that person is an IT consultant, can I open an IT recruitment and staffing company and alongside if I get a corporation to corporation contract with other company to provide IT consulting services? Um, 
So uh, the question is about you know that whether or not that would be an, an okay E2 business. And also, will we uh, W2 contract or corporation to corporation contract work in that case? Yeah. So um, you know, I, I think that uh, yeah, like. I, I think I understand this question. Ultimately, like, let's say you're entering as an IT consultant, you're running your own IT consulting company, um, and another company wants to hire you as an IT consultant, they can hire your company. So they couldn't hire you as a W-2, they couldn't hire you as an individual. But yes, you can have a corporation to corporation contract, um, you know, to, to provide those services. That being said, as the E-2 investor, you are meant to primarily be developing and directing your consulting company. So, um, you know, again, they're very sensitive to the idea of someone coming in and just working only as a solo consultant for another company. So you do, if you're doing that, it's fine, but you do want to be, you know, you do want to make sure you have multiple clients. You do want to have enough work that you can hire employees. Um, you know, if your aim is to be able to get the E2 renewed. Um, good. Thanks, Kelly. Um, another question here is about the hiring requirement for the E2. The question is, would hiring another service business to help run a business count towards hiring requirements? For example, this is uh, hiring an answering service to answer calls, like a call, call center, for example. It, it doesn't. Yeah, you, you you would need to have employees. Um, I mean, again, you can try to make creative arguments, um, you know, like for 1099s and things like that for, for independent contractors. But I think hiring an outside vendor is going to be even more attenuated than having, you know, an individual independent contractor. So you, it doesn't really count towards marginality. You would need to, you know, to work more on hiring. Makes sense, yeah. Um, next question is about real estate. I think we touched on that during the presentation, but the question is about um, a real estate wholesaling company and whether or not that would qualify. Um, there's not much investment um, other than running ads or other marketing, but could uh, property management into the business once property are acquired? So question whether or not the, that type of business would qualify. Yeah, I'd say that would be something where you'd want to set up a consult to discuss what you mean by, by real estate wholesaling. I, I think like the whether or not it's viable is really kind of in the details of what's being done and and, and what's being offered. Um, so certainly something, you know, we could discuss more a, on a consultation. And the last question for today is going to be about, uh, I'm sure this is something that uh, comes up uh, frequently, but it's a question about a pathway um, after the E2 to a green card status. Sure. Yeah. Lots of lots of questions about this. And we do actually have specific webinars that go over this um, that have, uh, you know, more much more specifics about kind of what potential green card options could be available. Um, I think there's a misconception sometimes that if you're on a non-immigrant visa for a certain amount of time, it will lead to a green card, like an H-1B leads to an employment-sponsored green card or an L-1 leads to an EB-1C. Um, that being said, it, it's really not the case. There are visas that kind of um, align better with different types of uh, green card options, but if you're in the U.S. on an E-2 and there's any green card you're, you know, that's available to you, you can apply for it. So, um, you know, there is no specific pathway. You know, that being said, some pathways our clients have used are one is the EB-2 National Interest Waiver. So if you are engaging in an endeavor of substantial merit and national importance, um, kind of over and above just kind of running a successful business, um, you know, that's something that could be, you know, a potential pathway. Um, similarly, if, you know, we have clients who are doing EB-5, you know, where they're investing, you know, 800000 or, you know, $1,050,000, creating 10 full-time jobs, that can be a potential pathway. And there are others as well. Um, you know, again, I would, I would encourage you to check out um, both on YouTube, um, and then we also do live webinars that focus on, um, you know, green card options for entrepreneurs. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, since we have a couple of minutes left, uh, we also have uh, additional questions here. So that question, I think, is about whether or not the investor's spouse can work for the E2 company as an employee. Yeah, so they can, um, but it's not very helpful for marginality. Uh, so it, it is very common. I think it does happen a lot and that's fine and, um, you know, certainly viable, but um, it doesn't it doesn't count towards marginality. So you really do want because, the again, the marginality requirement is the business supports more than just the investor and their family. Uh, so you do want to be hiring people that are outside your family. Great. Thanks. Um, and then the last question here is about the services that we offer, whether or not we uh, also provide L1 services, assistance or just E2. Yeah, so so we do. We are a full service immigration law firm, and we do offer L one services um, along with E two as, as as well as you know other all other kind of you know business focused um, you know family focused uh, you know immigration options. 
So I think that was it in terms of questions for today. Fantastic. All right. Well, um, thank everyone so much for for joining and for your great questions. Um, thank you as well, uh, Hugh, for uh, you know running the uh, the Q and A and the introduction. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank Thanks. you.